Good morning and welcome to our service of the Word this morning uh, on this, the second Sunday of Advent and the second Sunday in which uh, we have been worshipping online and as you will have heard uh, in the, the week that's just drawn to a close, uh, that uh, next Sunday, uh, the third Sunday in Advent, we will once again be able to join together and worship Almighty God. Looking forward to that, looking forward to seeing you uh, in person, those of you that are able to come out. Um, so please uh, start uh, booking once again online, or not online, by uh, phoning Caroline um, on uh, Monday coming. We now turn to uh, our service and um, we're going to begin with the, the words of the greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and, and also with you. Our first hymn is from Thanks and Praise number 59. I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. together in, uh, in person here in the church and uh, through the computer online. We thank you, Father, that we can join together as your body in this place um, and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for that privilege uh, at this time. And now, Father, we come to you um, mindful of uh, our own inadequacies and our need for, for forgiveness and coming with a thankful heart. Uh, we now confess our sins to God our Father. Lord God, 
Lord God, we come to you with sorrow for our sins and we ask for your help and strength. Help us to know ourselves, accept our weakness and resist temptation. Strengthen us with your forgiving love so that we may more courageously follow and obey your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sin and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Church's Prayer for the Second Sunday of uh, Advent. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armour of light, now in this time of this mortal life, in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to, to the life immortal, to him who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, now and for ever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, <clears throat> comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the, pe surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid, says the towns of Judah. Here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. 
I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that wherever we are, we are sure that you are with us. So Lord, as we open your word this morning, as we look at this passage in Mark's Gospel, God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you will speak to each of us. May we all come away from this morning being encouraged and knowing you more. And we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I wonder if I ask you the question, what was or what is your dream job? I wonder what your answer would be. Maybe it would be a teacher or a chef or a doctor or a nurse, a joiner or a plumber, or maybe you're a really adventurous person. Maybe all that sounds really boring. And for you, you'd like to be an astronaut or a brain scientist or whatever, something extravagant. For me growing up, my dream, my dream career was always to either be a footballer or be a fireman. And never, never in a million years did I think I would end up being a minister. But whether we are in our dream jobs or we, we had them or want them, we all have jobs to do in this life. Whether it is a full-time job or it is working in the house or doing a job for a family member or a friend, we all have things and jobs we have to do. And there are reasons for us doing them. And in our passage this morning, Mark introduces his gospel by explaining to each of us the job that John the Baptist had and the reason that he had to do it. And ultimately, Mark's gospel is all about Jesus, all about the good news and the acts of Jesus Christ. But he takes time at the very outset to tell us the important work of John the Baptist. And if you think of a town crier, someone who goes around and goes, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, he comes with news, important news for a town. I know we don't have that today, but that is sort of what the job of John was. He was to go and to tell people of this news. And you think of the movie this morning, you think of a really great storyline. Really good movies, when they start, they give you a cutscene at the very beginning that brings us back in time. And they tell you a story of what happened in order for this main storyline to take place. And that is what we have in our passage this morning. The cutscene is of John the Baptist preparing the way for the ministry of Jesus. So let's jump into this passage and see what this job of John really is and the purpose for it. And the first thing I want us to look at and think about this morning comes from verses 1 to 3. So if you have a Bible with you at home, do open up and follow along. But I want us firstly to look at the call of John the Baptist. Mark at the very beginning of this passage uses words from Isaiah 40 and chapter and verse 3. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And what John is doing, I'm sorry, what Mark is doing here at the very beginning is showing us that the good news of Jesus isn't just something that is disconnected from the Old Testament, but rather it is a fulfillment of that. And what is interesting about this prophecy we find in Isaiah is that it isn't just about Jesus. It's not just about the Messiah coming, but rather it is also about the one who will come before. The one who will come and he'll prepare the way and prepare people's hearts for Jesus' ministry. And John's calling here really is to lay the groundwork as such for Jesus, to prepare people for his teaching and for his miracles and to accept him. And if we're honest this morning, sometimes preparation can be a pretty boring task. I don't know if you've ever painted a fence, but if you have a wooden fence and you want to paint it, it is quite a boring job to get that fence ready for painting. You have to go with a piece of sandpaper and sand it all down to get all the old paint off and to make that wood nice and smooth. Because if you don't do that, 
you'll have an absolutely terrible job. The new paint won't take well at all. And if you have a massive garden and a lot of fencing to do, that can be a really mundane job. It can be something that we look at and go, nah, that's not worth the time. But if we don't do it, the job will be poorly done. And this is what Mark is doing at the beginning of his gospel. Despite the gospel being focused on Jesus, he is making it clear just how important John's role and job is to Jesus' effectiveness of his ministry. And if we take a moment just to, to stop right now, it really is an amazing prophecy that we read in these opening verses. Because, to be honest, this, this prophecy and this passage isn't just about John the Baptist. Yes, it was, and it was preparing the way, and it was prophesying of his work, but it also is a prophecy that speaks to each of us as Christians today. Because this job of preparing the way for Jesus' coming and his ministry wasn't just for John, it is for each and every one of us today. And the second thing I want us to look at this morning is to look at the job of John. So what did this job that he was called to do look like? Well, Mark in verses 4 to 6 gives us a few details. He tells us about the location of his work. He tells us what the task and what the job looked like. And then finally, in some senses, he tells us what John's uniform looked like. So the location, if we look at verse 4, it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So the location is the wilderness. And the wilderness has great significance. The wilderness here has been talked about is between the east and the west side of the Jordan. It was an area back then that the Romans would have watched very closely. They would have paid interest there because there was a lot of political tension going on. Historically, if we look back into the Old Testament, we see that it's the same wilderness that Joshua led the people of Israel across into the Promised Land. And many Old Testament stories were based in the wilderness across the Jordan. So this would have been a significant thing for Mark's original readers, because they would have known of the stories of the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and through all that time being sustained by God, a familiar place for them. And then in the latter part of verse 4 and into verse 5, it tells us what his task entailed. Preaching a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins and then physically baptizing those who confess their sins to God. And for Jews themselves, the idea of baptism wouldn't have been a new concept. The Old Testament prophets often spoke about washing yourself to make yourself clean from sins. And also those who want to convert to Judaism would have had to go through a baptism to enter into the Jewish faith. However, this call of baptism by John would have taken them all by surprise because he wasn't telling um, new converts to come in and be baptized. He was telling them all to be baptized, whether they were new Jews or they'd be in the Jewish faith their entire life. They were called to be baptized. And what is making clear to us as his readers now, but also to the readers uh, in the original contact, is that their religion as such was getting in the way of them being ready to accept Jesus. And because of that, they had to repent and be baptized. And I'm sure you know this, but the, the word repent literally means to turn around, to turn away. And this is what John was calling the people of the Jewish people back then to do, to turn away from their sinful lives, to turn away from their religion and to turn back to God, the one who led their ancestors through the wilderness and the one who gave them all that they need. So a sign that we see in our passage this morning that they were repentant and they did turn back to God was that so many came and they were baptised. 
And it's important for us to, to note that it doesn't mean that every time we, we mess up, every time we sin, and every time we want to go to God to repent, we have to be baptized, because that is not at all what this passage is saying. Because there is one baptism, and that is sufficient for all. But it is a reminder for them that through baptism, and ultimately what is about to come through Jesus' life, his death and his resurrection, when they sin, they can freely come to God and repent. Wherever they are, whatever they have done, God will be there and he will meet them with his grace. So that's his location and that was his task. And now we get to his uniform. In many jobs, a uniform is required. And it's there so people know that that person works for a certain company or in a certain place. And when you put on the uniform of that company, you are a representative of that place. And I used to work in Tesco's um, a good few years ago now, but I had to wear a Tesco uniform when I was there. And the purpose of that really was just so people could come to me and ask where things were. And they often would have been shocked because I didn't have a clue where anything was. But anyway, the purpose was I wore that uniform so people knew I worked there. And in verse 6 of our passage this morning, Mark tells us of John's uniform as such. It says that now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and he had locusts and wild honey. And it's quite clear from this passage that John certainly wasn't a fashion icon. He didn't care at all about what he wore. He didn't go out to expensive shops and buy the best clothes. He basically wore rags, the sort of clothing someone pretty poor would have worn themselves. And if we look on, we, we see that his eating wasn't of much better quality either. He went around each day and he caught locusts for his main course and then he went and he found a beehive for honey for his dessert. It doesn't sound great. Well, maybe it does you, but it definitely doesn't to me. No fancy clothing, no fancy meals out or takeaways, only the basics. But what John wore and what John ate was a statement from him more than anything. Firstly, if we look at his clothing and we look back to the Second Kings, it, it tells us that the clothing that John wore was the same as the clothing the prophet Elijah wore in the Old Testament when he went around preaching repentance. So what John is showing the people and he's showing us that he was in line with the Old Testament prophets. Those who were used as God's mouthpieces in the Old Testament, he was now being used as God's, mouth, God's mouthpiece now. And secondly, this is a huge statement to the Jewish people around him, that he was not conforming to the world and its material desires, but rather he was focused simply on the ways of Jesus and the ways of his word. So that's his job. And then the final two verses this morning, they tell us about the purpose of John the Baptist. And at times we can often lose sight of the future. And when we're in work, we often just want to get the job done, don't we? We don't often think about what is to come next or what this piece of work may look like down the line. But when we see our passage this morning, we see that John does not do this. In fact, despite his current task, he has his eyes fixed on what is next. And he also makes sure that everyone else around him has their eyes fixed on what is yet to come. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I. The strap of his sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And what John is showing us here and everyone else is that it is all simply about Jesus. That was his main purpose, to point people towards he who was coming next, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And it would be very easy in, back then for John to get a big head. You know, he was doing great work. People were coming out 
from everywhere to come to him, to repent to God and to be baptized by him. He would have been as such almost a celebrity. People would have known about him greatly. But what we see is the complete opposite of that with John. Because he knew that he wasn't important. He knew that his purpose and his job wasn't the main point. But rather it was simply the beginning of an amazing story. And the full realisation of the message of repentance that he was preaching was yet to come when Jesus began his ministry. And he tells him that he is not worthy to even stoop down and untie the sandals of Jesus. And if you think of all these people coming out to see John, coming out because of what he was doing, they would have heard about him everywhere. What a shock this would have been when they heard him say this, that he who was baptising them now was not worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. The one who was coming next is far greater than he and far greater than anyone else on this earth. But more importantly, the final sentence of this passage this morning is key to us all. John tells him that he baptizes them with water, but Jesus will baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And what this means is for those who repented and were baptized, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God's presence would be with them always. And in the Old Testament, we see that God's presence dwelt with Israel in the pillar of cloud and of fire. But when these people were baptized by the Holy Spirit, they would be filled with the presence of God. And the presence of God would dwell physically within them. And this is what John's ultimate purpose is. To prepare the people to receive the presence of God. To prepare the people to receive the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ and all that came with that. So as we come to a finish the, this morning, I want to challenge and I want to encourage each of us who are listening. Firstly, that this job is not simply for John the Baptist. It wasn't a job that was meant for just this time, but it's a job that is called upon all of us, those who follow Jesus today. And there is so much we as disciples of Jesus can learn from this passage this morning about our callings as Christians. Firstly, as we looked at John's location for his work, we need to realise that where we are is where God wants us to be. God has placed us where he wants us to be. It's not a coincidence, but rather it is part of God's kingdom plan. And secondly, we are to be repentant people. We live in the light of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Privileged people to be able to come to God and say sorry. And no, we will not be met with judgment, but with his grace. But we are also to let that truth be preached in our lives, with our words and with our actions. To preach a life of repentance to those who do not know Jesus. And thirdly, we are also called to be like John and how we relate to the world around us. Yes, we are in the world, but we are not to be of the world. We are to live a life seeking after Jesus and not material things that the world tells us that we need, but rather live a life seeking after him. Because if we conform to this world, we will never stand out. And only by living countercultural lives can we stand out in the world around us and point people to Jesus. So as we are in this season of Advent, as we reflect on the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago, and as we await as faithful people, people his coming again, I want to ask us all a question as I close. Are our lives pointing people to the coming of Jesus? Are our lives pointing people to the coming of Jesus? Let us pray.
Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the God of all gods, that you are the King of all kings. That, Father, you sent your Son into this world for people like me and for everyone else, that we may come to know you. And we thank you for this passage this morning. We thank you what we can learn from it. And Father, we pray that you will help us to, to take up that calling like John did, to prepare people for you, to prepare the way for your coming again, so that people may be in a place to receive you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nathan for sharing uh, with us from Mark's Gospel and the life of John the Baptist and uh, as we now turn again to sing uh, we're going to worship God in the, the hymn from thanks and praise uh, number 134 which um, picks up very much on the themes uh, that Nathan has shared with us uh, today so let's uh, sing together Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy name. Trust in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe, I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed the world? I, I believe, believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? I, I believe, believe and trust in him. him. This is the faith of the church. This, this is, is our faith. faith. We, we believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, Son and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you sent your Son to redeem the world and will send him again to be our judge. Give us grace so to imitate him in the humility and the purity of his first coming, that when he comes again, we may be ready to greet him with joyful love and firm faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. It had been prophesied that there would be a messenger to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Now John the Baptist appears with his urgent message of repentance. That repentance, that message of repentance is as true then as it is today. And we now turn to, to God uh, in our prayers of intercession, uh, mindful of our need uh, to, to always turn to him and turn away from what we've done uh, that is wrong and sinful. And so now uh, we pray, um, uh, knowing that God is with us and that he hears uh, all this in, uh, uh, in my words and our words, uh, what is in our thoughts and what is on our hearts. He knows uh, what we are offering up in prayer. Uh, this morning. And so today we want to begin by praying for uh, Christians all over the world. And um, as, as we pray for Christians across the globe, uh, we start with those that are far from us, uh, those whom uh, we have supported as a parish in mission. You might remember uh, Kylie and Bim uh, in India. We remember um, the Scots, uh, Lynn and Keith, who on this day, uh, the 6th uh, of December, arrive home uh, in Ireland, having finished their term in the mission field. Uh, we pray for them uh, as they uh, readjust and settle back in uh, to life in uh, Ireland. And we pray, Father, that you would be with them and guide them as they make those adjustments and they look to the future. Um, Father, we thank you for those that have gone from these shores uh, to, to share uh, your word and to serve in your name. And uh, we remember uh, the churches in those areas where they serve. We ask you, Father, um, also as we uh, pray closer to home. Uh, we thank you for uh, Bishop George and uh, we pray for him uh, in this time uh, and uh, we ask you Father as he begins his episcopacy uh, in this diocese uh, that you would give him a vision uh, for us as your people in this place and that uh, uh, you would guide him and, uh, and bring around him people that will assist him in his ministry. And uh, Father, as we pray for him, we pray for ourselves here in Macragall. We thank you, Father, for those uh, who lead within this parish. We thank you, Father, for those that are part of that team um, and the different aspects of their ministry. We pray for uh, Nathan and we pray for John uh, and in the preaching of the word. We pray for all those who um, who uh, work uh, in different ways across our parish, in the different groups that haven't been meeting. We thank you, Father, for them, and uh, we'd ask you, Lord, your blessing upon them uh, in this time. And we ask you, Father, for a real longing uh, for you in our lives, a longing that is um, not uh, satisfied by anything else, uh, that on our hearts, is uh, a zeal and a passion for you and your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. And we pray today for the different countries uh, of the world and those who exercise power and influence. Um, we pray for uh, the, the American state um, as it is entering a period of transition. Uh, we pray, Father, for guidance upon those who, who lead in that nation. Uh, we pray for the nations of Europe and the leadership therein. We are very mindful in our own land uh, of our relationship with the European Union and the importance in uh, this period of time uh, of uh, a negotiated uh, departure uh, from the uh, EU. And so we pray for those who, who have that responsibility and they be mindful for the needs of uh, the people across Europe. And we also uh, pray, Father, for our local assembly here in um, Stormont. And we would ask you, Father, as they respond to the pandemic, uh, that you would uh, give them a deep sense of your peace and your presence and decisions that they make, uh, that they would have unity in those decisions, that they would put for forward uh, policies that will bring equity and justice uh, across our community and uh, people would serve with honesty and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I also want to pray for those whom we love and um, we thank you, Father, for the blessing of those whom we love and are in our lives and, and relate to us in positive and encouraging ways and build us up. We thank you, Father, for them, be they family or friends. Uh, and we thank you particularly for those that uh, uh, call uh, upon you as their saviour and share with us uh, truths uh, uh, from, from you. Uh, and Lord, uh, as we remember them, and um, thank you for them. And uh, in this year, uh, it has been uh, a year in which uh, relationships have been uh, to the fore and uh, the value that we place on each other and uh, has come to the fore in and through our times of isolation and separation. We thank you, Father, for the gift of love and those you've put in our lives. And we remember those who are less fortunate in that sense and don't have uh, friends, family to support them. Help us, Father, to be uh, your hands reaching out to them. And as we remember them uh, and those whom we love, we also remember those whom we struggle to get on with and uh, we find hard to relate to. And we pray for more love in those relationships and we pray for uh, forgiveness. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And today we also want to remember those who are in pain and uh, as we remember those, we're thinking of people who are ill or in ho and in hospital or those who are in nursing homes, uh, particularly those uh, because they're so vulnerable to this uh, virus uh, and it seems to be centered so much uh, across our province in nursing homes. We pray for the safety of those uh, individuals that we know in nursing homes and we pray for all of them across uh, our land. We also remember those who are imprisoned uh, by addictions, be it drugs, drink, gambling. Uh, we pray, Father, for healing, wholeness and freedom that can only be found in you. Uh, and we'd ask uh, that doors would be open uh, and uh, hearts would be changed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we remember those, Father, who have gone before us. And we're ever so thankful for the ways in which they have influenced us and drawn us closer to you. And they are now with you and we have that assurance because they have faith in you. We thank you, Father, for them. And, uh, and as we remember them uh, today, uh, we'd, ask you, uh, we'd ask you to be with those who recently bereaved and are traveling that road. Uh, we'd ask you, Father, that they would know uh, your strength. And as we read in Isaiah, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. We pray, Father, that uh, that, that, that imagery uh, would be their experience. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And Father, as, as we reflect on that verse too, we just remember those um, he tends those that have young. We remember those uh, in our community uh, who look after the, the children. Uh, we remember uh, those in schools, those in nurseries, uh, and we particularly remember families and uh, those that are called uh, uh, to care for children. And we remember the unborn as well. We pray, Father, your protection over all that young life in this time of pandemic. And we remember in particular those who are suffering uh, uh, from mental health. Uh, and we pray, Father, uh, for wholeness therein. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. We thank you, Father, for showing us uh, what needs putting right in our own lives and forgiving us all that is past. And in a moment now of quiet reflection, um, we, we come to you with uh, Nathan's uh, words uh, that you put on his lips and would ask you, Father, to speak uh, to us and into our hearts today in a transformative way as we go from this place having heard your word. We come before God now, uh, bringing our own needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And as we go from church, we pray together. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfil our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Amen. Let's join together as a congregation in the words of the grace as we conclude our service. The grace, grace of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the love, love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.